Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Policy and Practice's first webinar of 2019. It's great to have you all here today, and you're very welcome uh, on this wintry day. Um, so today's webinar is be Budgeting Support, Best Practice Ways to Help Low-Income Households, and we're delighted to have so many of you here on the call today. Um, just while we get started, I will do a little bit of housekeeping uh, and do an audio check, please, if I may. Um, in the panel on the right hand side, um, please find where you can raise your digital hand. Uh, just give me a quick wave so I know that you can hear me OK. Um, while you're doing that, um, you'll be familiar that in this panel as well, uh, this is where you can ask questions uh, for the presenters and there will be time during the webinar at the end for you to ask those questions and get answers, <laughs> plenty of time. Uh, we'll have a couple of um, polls during the webinar and there are some downloads that you can download in this panel at any time at all. Uh, so do take the time to do that. And there'll be a very short five question survey at the end of the webinar, which we'd really appreciate your feedback on. We will have you on your way by 11.30 um, as everybody has busy days. So. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for uh, raising your hands. That's great to see. Uh, let me move on and introduce you to today's speakers. I have um, Donna Gallagher from Policy and Practice. Donna, do you want to say hi? Morning, all. I have Marie Hardiman from the Guinness Group. Marie, would you like to say hi? Morning, hi. And I have Peter Carter, my colleague from Policy and Practice. Peter, do you want to say hi? Hi, good morning, everybody. Let me be the last to wish everybody a happy new year. <laughs> and the end of January, you just got in there. Well done. Nothing good. Nothing good. <laughs> so today's agenda, we will be talking, I'll just give you just a very, very brief introduction to policy and practice with so many new people on the webinar today, which is brilliant. Lovely to see. Thank you. Um, just to tell you a little bit about us. But the main part of the uh, agenda today is to look at um, debt and budgeting. So personal debt. Donna is going to talk to us about the size and nature of the problem in the UK and uh, give some overall context um, for Donna to then talk to us about, sorry, Marie then to talk to us about how the Guinness Group is helping their tenants manage their money. Um, and Peter is going to talk then about software that the Guinness Group use to a little bit of a demo um, and uh, just point out features that can help with all of this. Um, Q&A, as I said, for our speakers at the end. So do please pop your questions into the panel as and when they occur to you. So without further ado, a little bit about policy and practice. Uh, we're an organisation that makes the welfare system uh, simple to understand and to navigate so that people can make the decisions that are right for them. And that is why we exist. That's, a, that's a, our, our raison d'etre. We believe the welfare system can work better. Uh, and we have three, we, we, we have three uh, services uh, that we uh, have developed in order to achieve this. Um, the first is our policy. We, we're, we're a team of professionals who have extensive knowledge of the welfare system and we're passionate about social policy, good social policy. Uh, you may see us in the news, Devon sometimes is uh, a media uh, spokesperson um, and so that's kind of where our policy analytics work comes from. The data analytics work that we do with lots of local authorities uh, uh, helps them to explore data over time to identify people who may need support. Um, then we help organisations to target the support where it is most needed and also to track those interventions, see how well they're working over time. But the thing that we're talking about today is our award winning software. Uh, and this is the software that helps grow the financial resilience of people that you may be working with uh, with our fast and accurate benefit and budgeting calculator. So that's the focus of today's session. OK, so just to get you comfortable and engaged and feet under the table, I'm going to serve our first poll, which is uh, what do you find are the main causes of debt, personal debt for your customers? So if you just bear with me while I uh, serve our first poll. Um, and hopefully you should see this on your screen now. It should be coming up now. Um, so uh, the question in the poll then is, uh, what do you find are the main causes of um, debt for your customers? And the options that you can choose are um, overspending, high interest charges, lack of financial knowledge, an income shock or insufficient income. Um, I can see you all voting. Thank you very much. I shall uh, 
uh, give you a little while longer. I do appreciate that uh, very often, and indeed it's, it's maybe something that Donna and Marie and, and, and Peter might want to comment on, but very often it's a combination uh, of all of these uh, issues. Um, but if you could choose one, um, that would be great. So very interesting answers coming in. Thank you very much. Uh, I shall just um, let a few more people take time to vote. Excellent, great. So now I'm going to uh, close the poll and share the results with you. And you should see these on your screen shortly. Um, hopefully you can see that. Uh, what I've got, the answers that I can see are that 53% of you say that insufficient income um, are the main causes of debt for your customers. Um, secondly, followed by lack of financial knowledge. Uh, then followed by overspending um, and 10% say it's an income shock and nobody uh, uh, says high interest rates are the common, uh, are the common reason. Um, Don and Marie, Peter, would you like to comment at all on any of those findings? I, I would say that insufficient income would be, is right that it's, it's top. I think what we find when we try and support people, Janet, is that budgets are very, very stressed, stretched and the the overspending sometimes can come from from the income shop in the fact that there could be prior commitments before the income reduces but it is getting very very challenging to support people with with budgets because income is so limited mm -hmm. absolutely okay um brilliant thank you very much everybody so i'm going to hide that poll um and then i think donna we can forward to yourself um to talk to us about the, the bigger picture and the, and the context um, for, for personal debt in the UK. Thanks, Janet. Um, morning, everybody. So I just want to take you through some high level um, information just to give you a bit of a feel for what's going on in the UK. Um, and I took this information for the first slide from um, the, the National Audit Office report, which was published in August of last year. And what this does was it, it was aiming to conclude on the Treasury's overall approach to over indebtedness and how well it brings government departments and other stakeholders together. So these are some of the high level findings um, and, and what they've reported that the Money Advice Service have said that there's 8.3 million estimated number of people over indebted in the UK and that 22% of UK adults have less than £100 in savings. And I think that, that that figure, when I first read that, I thought that that was quite low because as a support worker in the past, I've, it would be very rare that I would I would support somebody with debt or budgeting that would have more than £100 in savings. And quite often, they didn't have any savings. So I wasn't surprised, although I thought it was on the low, on the low side. 40% um, of people reported debt problems in 17, 18 related to debt sold in government, up from 21% in 2011-12. Now, we're going to look at this a little bit further at the next slide um, but I think that that's quite quite stark. Um, the annual cost, the estimate annual cost to the public purse is 248 million but the, the report states that there's still more to do to actually find out the true cost particularly around government departments and um, because there is limited data sharing that, 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 that they've got um, and quite starkly 15 billion total outstanding mortgage arrears in 2018. And this this is, you know, putting pressures on wider services and, and not just as an example in, for, for there to the mortgage company. We've got 18 billion estimated personal debt owed to government, utility companies, landlords and housing associations, and an estimated four in 10 people in the UK can't manage their money well day to day. Now, if we just look, back at the poll, that, that would echo what the, what the results of the, the poll have said. Probably one of the most troubling things that I, the, that I thought of the report was it, there's, a, there's a, approximately 600,000 people who can't access debt advice. Now, that's a shortfall in the amount of debt advice. Um, and, and what the Money Advice Service have said is that the capacity would need to increase by 50% over the next two years just to satisfy demand. So putting this into context, it already spends 48 million a year on directly commissioning services. And it's also estimated that other organizations and indiv individuals, voluntary, 
voluntarily provide an estimated 148 million. Now that's absolutely massive. Um, but to say that they would need to have 50% increase demonstrates the scale of the problem. Next slide, please, Janet. So here we can see uh, the report shows um, that people are increasingly reporting problems with debts owed to government and utility providers, and this is compared to retail lending, so that's actually lower. So what you can see here is the problems related to um, government debts, such as council tax or benefits, as previously mentioned, has gone from 21% to 40% in the space of, you know, from 2011 to 2017-18. And the proportion of debts relating to consumer credit is reduced from 52% to 33% over the same period. Now, this is from the, the um, obviously, the National Audit Office report. Step change and money advice have also commented that they echo the findings and the proportion of clients that they support are the government and utility providers. Next slide, please, Janice. So this is um, from the TUC. And what they've said is uh, there's been a rise in unsecured debt in 2018. So this is excluding um, mortgages. And that they're seeing that on average, it's hit a new record of 15,400 per household. And it's gone up in a third of the quarter um, in 2018. And it's been a rise of 890 on year. Um, and I think where you can see see the spike, it's increased from 2008 quite significantly to 2018. Next slide, Janice. What you can see here, so if you go back one please, Janice. What you can see here is the insecure debt as a share of income. So the total unsecured debt has risen to 428 billion and it's 30.4% 30, 30 of household income. It's higher than before the financial crisis. So you can see there in 2008, you can't see my cursor, but if you draw the line straight across, that's quite, quite a significant peak um, compared, to, compared to 2008 to what it was last year. And that just shows that people are relying on unsecured credit just just to get by or perhaps borrowing more or having the, the ability to borrow more than the, what they have previously. Um, and what the report says is the big the biggest victims um, and the people who are relying on um, unsecured credit are the most um, are those who are struggling households. So just a little bit of um, information for some of the, the, the most common triggers for problem debt. Um, some of them might be obvious. You have redundancy. People people may not be in a position where they can plan for redundancy. So if they lose the job, you know, and they're only given a week or a month's notice, it's very difficult for them to plan. Particularly if you if you look back at the 22% who have got less than 100 pound in savings. Obviously, it would you know the same applies to unemployment. Um, people obviously claiming low income benefits will it'll struggle because you know the the income difference is quite significant if you if you've been working full time and, and, and taking home salary as an example. The it can coincide with illness and, and, and disability, including mental health. And what you find is that the ones that, when people are struggling with debt, the, in, as a cause of that, they will struggle with mental health and that they will become stressed and they'll have um, might suffer from anxiety as a result of it. And then you have debt consolidation. Now, the advice out there is quite quite varied around debt consolidation. Some people use it as a tool to try and bring outgoings, you know, more manageable as a, as a lower payment. But what what you find is with with um, perhaps people who have been in debt before that they then rely on borrowing again. So that you know they sort the problem once, but then they they're taking on more debt, so ending up back in the same situation. Then you have divorce and separation. Obviously, if, if somebody's leaving the household, um, or you suddenly go from a couple to to, to a single, you, you, you've lost a proportion of your income there. So pe people will struggle. Um, and obviously, you've got benefit changes and, and the gap of benefit income. The way for UC has been widely publicised that people are, are struggling until they get the first payment. 
and obviously persistent lower earnings. And I guess the key me the key message um, from from the research around debt is that is that households aren't protected from from this if they face a trigger situation, um, and that's where services will need to support people and where people might be be coming to yourselves um, to to get help and support moving forward. So supporting people to, to manage um, money. Obviously, you, I've mentioned that we've got a detrimental to people's well-being. There's an increase in stress, anxiety, time off work. This is where the impact of debt can, can have a knock-on effect to other services, um, you know, whether public or private. But you know, if, if somebody's poorly in, in, in the need and other support, um, th it's more than just the, the creditor or um, the person chasing the debt who's having contact with that person. One of the biggest problems that um, the Money Advice Service has said is that debt's often hidden and people aren't approaching um, providers for support until it's, it's absolutely critical. People have a real shame of admitting that they're in debt and then that need help, regardless of what trigger it's been. You know, somebody might have just lost, lost the job. They, they think that um, they can they can resolve the problem by by getting employment quickly. Um, they're trying to keep up with a lifestyle that they've had in the past, um, or, or people are just basically feeling feeling that it's shame, that feeling shame. Um, I've put here that debt advice needs to be controlled, split, and prioritised. If people are coming last minute and they've got you know, bailiffs at the door. You, you need to deal with the emergencies and then the priority debts and the non-priority debts and just bring in the immediate problem under control um, and then trying to support the person moving forward. Uh, it, you know, it's important of lifting the debt burden and trying to help them go forward. And, and you can do that with, with debt and budget and advice, but they are, they are very different, although often are, are provided by the same, same people. But debt and advice, is first and foremost about getting people back in control of the finances. So dealing with, you know, the, the red letters or the, the constant phone calls or the, the knocks at the door, for example, and then budget and support, helping them move forward and maintain control of the finances. One of the um, comments that have, that's been made is that it, there is a range of support available. And, and looking at a problem holistically, round about whether you maximise income, to do income and expenditure but often people don't know where that support is um, and working with you know within your area working in partnership with others who's best placed to best place to support the person move, moving forward we've got um, a case study to, to the right in, in your hands out handouts and this is from from Newcastle Council and they've kindly shared it with us and it, and it just goes to show how how looking at Debt holistically and not just focusing on one problem can can help support move somebody more sustainable. So you have somebody here who had 26% of income paid on the housing. There were nearly £15,000 in household debt. And after supporting a su successful um, debt relief order, they were receiving budget and advice. But what they did was they looked at the problem, they looked at the cause of the problem with, with housing and obviously finances and benefits, looked to maximise the income through welfare benefits advice and then moved the person to look at employment advice. And I think that's a really good, a really good evidence of how, how holistic support can help change somebody's situation in a short period of time and take it from a crisis point and identifying what the causes of the problems are and then moving them forward for the, for, for the future. So it's worth a read um, and if anybody wants to, to get further examples we can provide them. Um, but that was it from me, Janet. Just a, just a whistle stop tour on, on what the wider problem is that, that any report we can, we can share. Um, and, and basically, one of one of the other problems th that it does show is that departments don't share information, and data sharing can be quite difficult. But what you what you might want to think about is are you or are you chasing the same person for debt in different departments across or across different organisations in the same area, and how can you better join up um, and support somebody moving forward? Thanks, Janet.
Brilliant. Thanks ever so much, Donna. And um, and please, if I can remind you to, if you have questions for Donna, uh, do pop them in the panel, and we will come to them at the uh, towards the end of of the session. Um, this moves us nicely on to our next poll, our second poll of the day. Um, if you just bear with me, I will get this up on screen as we talk. OK, so this poll is uh, what are the main challenges your customers face uh, when trying to uh, to do budgeting? Um, so hopefully this should be coming up on your screen as we speak. Um, so please do take the time to vote. So, so yes, so the question is uh, very badly worded. I do apologize. But what are the main challenges your customers face uh, when trying to budget? Um, again, it's one option, and I appreciate that you know it's a combination very often. But the options we've given you to choose from uh, primarily expenditure exceeds income. Uh, do they have challenges in prioritizing debts? Uh, challenges in terms of coping with the cost of living? Uh, challenges in terms of reducing outgoings uh, and challenges in terms of improving their financial skills. Um, so lovely, I can see a lot of you voting as we speak. Um, thank you very much for that. I should just to give you a, uh, just five more seconds if you could. Um, and brilliant, excellent. I'll close the poll now. Thank you and share the results with you on screen. So hopefully uh, that should come up on your screen there now. So. Um, 40% of you say that the main challenge people have is the expenditure exceeds income. 34% say it's coping with the cost of living. 25% say prioritizing debts. And 2% say reducing outgoings. And nobody is saying that improving financial skills is the biggest challenge. Um, Marie, Donna, Peter, any comments on those results? Um, just very reflective of what we see here at Guinness. So it is usually that expenditure exceeds income. And I suppose that then links into um, it, customers find it difficult to reduce their outgoings. Um, but yeah, that is definitely reflective of our customer group. Lovely. Excellent. Thanks, Marie. Let me um, close this poll now uh, and then we can uh, move on to yourself, Marie, if I can get the slides lined up. Over to Marie. Yeah. Lovely. Thanks, Marie. Thank you. Um, good morning. Um, before I start um, on my slides, I suppose I'll, I'll just give you a little bit about my background and my relationship with policy and practice. I've been working at the Guinness Partnership for three years, but prior to that I'd got 16 years um, in local government, predominantly revenues and benefits, but then my last three years in local government were, uh, were at London Borough of Croydon. And our service evolved hugely during that time to include welfare and prevention services. And really, to back up sort of Donna's example, a much more holistic approach to supporting customers. Um, we worked with Devon, and I worked with Devon and Jade at Policy and Practice, um, primarily to analyse our data and to understand the impact um, of welfare reform and particularly UC on our customers. Um, and then when I moved to, to Guinness, at that point, policy and practice had, had started work on their budget calculation. It was in place, but mainly for local government, and they were looking to branch out to housing associations. So for me, that was a great opportunity to continue working together. Um, so in terms of Guinness, um, we're a national housing association. We've got 65,000 homes um, across England, and we've got 140,000 customers. Um, that comes with its challenges, especially coming from local government, where it's all one local authority. We actually cover 165 local authority areas, um, and let alone job centres. So when we're looking at universal credit, we, we cover a number of job, job centres within those local authorities. And I lead our customer account service, um, who are responsible for collection and prevention of debt. Um, we currently have around £10 million um, of arrears which is 3.6% uh, of a percent, our percentage of debit. So we're, we're fairly financially strong. Our arrears are, we're in the top quartile, um, but we are facing growing challenges as a result of universal credit. We've currently got 26,000 customers um, out of our 140,000 in arrears. In terms of our customers, um, when I joined, we've got three main services who were providing budgeting support to our customers. All of them were using different mechanisms to do this, so different budget calculations for, from some more sophisticated ones that, that you may be familiar with to basic spreadsheets. 
And I think it's fair to say we had a, a fairly inconsistent approach and we're given our customers an inconsistent service. Uh, the three main services are our lettings and allocation service, our customer account service, which is my service, so um, providing support for customers in arrears, and then our customer support teams, which you will know as things such as your welfare rights services, maybe your financial inclusion teams. Um, as you probably experience in your own authorities, we would have different conversations depending on the intended outcome. So um, customers would see us as um, isolated services and we might have a conversation with a customer who wants to demonstrate affordability so that they can um, get one of our homes with our lettings teams and one set of income details will be provided. We will then have a separate conversation from an arrears point of view to say, great, you've moved in, but you've not paid any money. Let's look at your income and expenditure. We might get a different version of events because it's then trying to demonstrate that they can't afford a repayment plan. And then we'd be working with our customer support teams who are trying to identify opportunities to maximise income and might get a more, they might go into a bit more detail and get a more reflective picture. So I suppose from a customer point of view, we were inconsistent. In terms of technology, because three different services were operating in isolation, we've got no visibility internally um, of our customer circumstances. We were given a, a pretty low level of customer services because customers were having to have the same conversation multiple times over. And we really didn't have a future-proofed model for any kind of self-serve or digital platform. And that included mobile workings because we're national. A lot of our officers are out and they're working in the field and they're, they're not office-based. So I suppose linking that back to my relationship with policy and practice, what attracted me to the, the, the calculator and the budgeting tool was that it would be one tool, um, so we'd have more consistency. And it's more than just a, an income and expenditure calculation. Um, I was particularly excited about the better off scenarios, being able to work with our customers to show them how their income may improve or not, depending on how their circumstances changed. And that links, links heavily into the universal credit calculations and also the action plan functionality. So being able to talk to a customer at that early stage of sign up and say, yes, you meet the criteria for one of our properties, you've demonstrated affordability. However, we think there is more that we can do to max up, maximize your income, whether that's actual income into the household or your disposable income by looking at your debt and your outgoings. Um, that can then be interactive between the three services and the customer. So that, that was a great um, plus for me. And then the ability to have the self-serve options so that as we progress digitally, our customers can, can use the calculator without even needing to talk to us. Um, next slide, please, Janet. So um, that's sort of why we wanted to get involved and, and, and what the tool can, can, we thought could provide for us. But then how are we actually going to learn, launch this? So um, we're talking around 250 users across the three services. My service has got 91 members of staff that would be accessing that tool. Um, so the three services are lettings, customer accounts and customer support. Quite big services. How do you get everybody involved? So initially, I, I set up some working groups that um, had a range of operational managers, team managers, and then the actual advisors and officers that would be using the tool. Policy and practice were heavily involved at this stage, and um, they came to our, our national office, our, our main office up in Manchester, and did a, a set of demos with these working groups. Um, they were very open to um, expanding their tool across housing associations, so we were able to provide ideas around improvements, changes, and things that could be more specific to housing associations and then heavily involving that group in, in all of the testing so that we really got our staff buy-in right from the start. What I'd have liked to have done is a little bit more engagement with our customers, but at that point, the way that we were geared up, we, we just weren't able to do that. So the, the engagement with customers was much closer to our launch and our rollout. Um, launching that then across those three services, it was really important for me that the team saw how it needed to be interactive internally as well, so that our customers got that consistent approach and throughout their journey, regardless of whether they're touching multiple services um, and perhaps multiple times they're talking to all of us, um, we still had that consistent approach. 
So there was initially a, a classroom environment with some test cases. Policy and practice were great in setting us up with a test, um, a test database, if you like, so that we could get mixed, um, mixed sessions with, with staff from all areas of, of those businesses um, working together to look at some live customer cases in a test scenario. Um, we then launched, we had a, a very high profile launch across those services. We all let, went live on day one. Lots of buzz around the, the business around that. Lots of internal comms about the launch. Um, we set some initial targets to try and incentivize staff to, to use the tool because we to really demonstrate the benefits we needed to have a, a high usage. Uh, what we didn't want is half of the service still using existing calculations. So we, we switched all of those off. And the targets were, were simply 100% usage for our affordability assessments. So we removed all of the affordability calculations and the, the budget planner was the only, the only mechanism we had to determine affordability as part of the, the wider application process. Within our customer account service, we acknowledge that some people who are in arrears, it's a short-term fix, short-term problem, and potentially they're agreeing to pay their, their debt off quite quickly. Um, it's affordable. It could even be a one-off payment that they're going to clear the balance all, all in one go next month. So we acknowledged that we didn't need to use a full budget planner for every customer. Um, so we set in place 75% of all arrears arrangements we would use use the tool and for our customer support team 100% of all, all referrals. We had some incentives around those targets. Um, we're a housing association, we're not for profit, so there was nothing, nothing too funky, no financial incentives, but there was some healthy competition between teams about how we were using um, the, the calculator. And then we were quickly able to demonstrate the benefits and provide some case studies. Um, I suppose really that the, the, the Anecdotal benefits were just better conversations. Our, our quality scores were increasing, so our call quality. Um, the conversations we were having with customers were much more informed and, and much more two-way. Um, as we're going through the budget planner, it, it was obvious that at certain points that there were things where we felt we could maximise income or outgoings perhaps weren't prioritised in the way they needed to be, given that they were in debt. So there was a much better flow of, of, of conversation. And quite often the customer, as they were talking through their, their budget with us, would identify the problems themselves without us needing to do that. It improved our lettings, so we were letting to customers who could afford properties, whereas we'd had scenarios where we're letting properties to customers, which sounds great, but then quite quickly it was apparent that tenancy was never going to be affordable for them. And that's been a, a, not a great customer journey because then they still need to find accommodation and potentially could lead to evictions. Um, it did lead to improved arrangements, so much more sustainable arrangements uh, for our arrears and also enabling customers to build up credit so they should pay their rent in advance with us. And we promote that heavily to try and help with the transition to universal credit. So it really helped customers see how long it would take to clear their debt, but then could they actually pay extra after the debt's cleared to get them into a healthy position. Um, I suppose the flip side, so that's all very positive, very happy path, but from a business point of view internally, if a tenancy isn't affordable and there's no opportunity to maximise benefit, there's, there's nothing we can do to help bring the outgoings down, we're inevitably going to go through a legal route, potentially with the customer engaging in that process and aware that the, the outcome is to end that tenancy. It's a um, great evidence tool at court to demonstrate to judges that we really have done as much as we can to identify those opportunities. The customer's engaged, there is no disposable income and it's not going to be affordable. Or equally, um, I'm not sure how many on the call are, are involved in the, the legal side of, of rent arrears, um, but we were finding we were getting a, a disproportionate amount of suspended possession orders. So we'd worked with the customer, we didn't feel that we could protect the tenancy, uh, we were going for outright possession, and we were getting a lot of suspended possession orders with arrangements of the old £3.65 a week even though that wasn't affordable and that would take a significant amount of time to clear the arrears and wasn't the best solution for the customer. By being able to provide some really robust and quite sophisticated budget information, including better off scenarios to show that things aren't going to get better, um, we're able to secure the, the right court orders for both the customer and the business. Also helps with our appeals and, and reconsideration process as well. And then I suppose with the how, you've got a huge sort of service area, three big service areas using 
that tool with the customer experience at the heart of that. So we held initially monthly reviews to see, make sure that it was working for both staff and for customers and customers were involved in that. That has then progressed to quarterly because we've been working with policy and practice now for, for over a year, almost two actually. Um, and we have quarterly reviews that policy and practice are involved with. They still come to our, our offices and are really, really keen to continually improve the tool and look at changes. And as a business, we're constantly reviewing our usage to make sure, sure we're using it in the right way um, and can we expand that across the business. Um, next slide, please, Janet. So I just wanted to give you a feel for, I've talked a lot about sort of why and, and how we've done it. I suppose I wanted to demonstrate some of, some of the benefits that, that we've seen. And I, I am a, a lover of black and white figures, some real tangible benefits, not just, you know, that anecdotal that it, that it feels good. So um, in, the, in the two years, well, just short of two years that we've been live, we went live in the, in the August, so I suppose 18 months, we've completed 55,752 assessments. Um, so given that we've got a stock of 65,000, I'm really pleased with that number. That's a, a really high volume. And we're not fully live with self-serve yet. So that's just interaction that, that we've had as a business with our customers. 38% of those have been brand new assessments, so where we haven't got any existing budgeted information. And then 62% are where we're going in and completing um, changes. So, so we've done an, uh, perhaps a, a budget assessment at sign up, so as part of affordability. And then we're going in and, and we're using that um, ongoing through the customer's history with us. For me, that is a huge positive. It's really easy to get by and, and do it as a one off, and you do a calculation with the customer the first time you speak to them. What's great is that we're really using that information to drive our conversations and the services that we provide and we're able to go in and, and instead of having that conversation from scratch with the customer again which is what we would have done previously we're able to go in and say I can see you've completed a budget planner with us before let's bring that up look at your, your action plan and let's go in and, and reassess that now you've had a change um, 29,243 budget advice provisions so not just completing the, the assessment actually going in to give some some more um, detailed budget advice um, linked to outcomes, so there would have been action plan um, agreements on the back of that. The figure that I would like to um, improve is the 1640. This is the scenario comparisons that we've done. And I feel some of that is actually the way that we're using the tool. I believe we probably do do more um, better off comparisons and scenario comparisons, but we're perhaps not always using the tool correctly to reflect that. So the conversations are taking place, but they're not following it through on the tool. So it saves that information. So that's something that I want to work with our, our staff on. 100% um, is, um, I, I thought 75% was um, um, a stretch target, shall we say, for, for the budget tool being completed for arrears arrangements. But we've, we've smashed it. We're, we're, we're doing over 100% on arrangements because we're using it for customers who are not necessarily in arrears, but they're telling us that they've got something coming up that's going to cause them problems. And we're using the budget tool to put advanced repayment plans in place. So to try and protect them getting into arrears. So we're at 100% usage for our um, lettings guys, our customer account service, and then our, our customer support referrals. On the right hand side, this is a little bit more sort of staff culture sort of related for me because it's really important that staff are happy with the tool. So our staff engagement scores are 86% um, against the target of 85. And whilst there's an, an awful lot that goes into that, the budget tool has really helped staff feel that they've got control over their conversations, they're providing a better service to customers, and they've all got visibility of conversations that have happened across the business. Um, leading on to development, really, we've been able to develop our staff through using the tool. It's really helped us identify some conversational skills that were needed to be a bit more solution focused, and it's really helped inform staff's decision making, so that's really helped their, their development. And then feedback, um, the feedback's just been great. We, we've got real buy-in from staff, so they're giving us regular feedback on, on how they're finding using the tool and things that they would like to change. Um, equally, it's two ways, so we're able to give feedback back from policy and practices to perhaps why a change can't be accommodated. You know, as much as they're, they're really keen to work with us, there are lots of customers using the tool, and we want to make sure that um, the changes that are made are fit for everybody that's using it. So that's been a really great two-way process. Um, final slide from me then, Janet, please. 
Um, so what next? So um, the two years really was embedding the tool, getting that buy-in and making sure that we're using it for the, the purpose it was initially intended. Um, we've been slow, I feel, especially coming from local government where um, I feel we really did have to push our, our digital platform. Um, we've been slow on, on that self-serve um, option for our customers. So I really want to put, we've, we've got a My Guinness portal and I will, really want to get that so that the budget tool is embedded in that. Internally, we can cope with when a customer wants to send their, their budget calculation to us for further support. I want us to be able to use our CRM to, to be able to target that to the correct service so we can pro provide that support. But ultimately, that a customer can complete it without needing to talk to us. Um, and then if need, we propose a payment arrangement on the back of that. Um, I want to expand our um, assisted self-serve. I've touched a little bit on using the better off scenarios more. As we um, have more and more customers moving on to universal credit around the country, I want to use it more for our universal credit calculations and start to use our action plans more so that customers are in control of what they can do as well as what we can do to improve their, their circumstances. And then the final one really for me is that coming from local government where we've got such a rich data set, albeit sometimes it, it's held in, in very different places, but even just having access to SHIBI data and housing benefit data, such a rich data set about our customers. To go into a housing association where you have none of that, you've got no information really about your customers and what you do have is manually recorded and rely on disclosure and manual updates. We've been working with policy and practice for two years now, so we've started to build that data set, albeit it's still on what customers have told us, but it's income and expenditure information, it's information about who's on universal credit, levels of arrears, um, it, it's information that we could now start to use a lot more intelligently to, to drive our service provision. Um, so that's something that I now want to, to move forward with policy and practice and, and work on. And I suppose in summary from me, it's, it's been really great to um, work with a company that really are, are keen and actively want to build the tool and, and build that information set with you. Um, so nothing but positive from me really. I suppose the, the obstacles have been more internally on, on getting that digital platform, the challenges on getting buy-in from customers, uh, sorry, from staff um, to use the tool, all of which have, have ended up very positively. So, um, yeah, I hope that's helpful. And if anyone's got any questions, I know we're going to have an opportunity at the end to, to talk it through. And my contact details will be available if anyone wants to talk in a bit more detail about our experience here at Guinness. Brilliant, Marie. Thank you ever so much. Uh, and please do um, take Marie up on that uh, question uh, session. We've got some um, we've got some questions in already. And I very quickly want to move over to Peter. Thank you ever so much, Marie. I want to move to Peter now, uh, who's going to give uh, a very quick um, demo, uh, show you in under the hood of the calculator. Uh, let me uh, share, um, change presenters uh, to yourself now, Peter. Uh, hopefully. Show my screen. Work. Yeah. Can you see my screen okay? I can see it, yeah. Well, how do you live up to that kind of billing? Thank you very much, Marie. Um, how do I show the calculator off to its full extent? Um, I just want to uh, look at some highlights and some pick up some of the points that Marie was talking about uh, and see if I can do it justice. Um, in front of you is, is, is the front screen of the calculator and in true Blue Peter style, um, I'm going to uh, show one I prepared earlier. Um, let me just quickly guide you through where, what we can see on the screen. This is the benefit and budgeting calculator. We're going to enter information into household details, property details, um, income and earnings. Um, and then ultimately we'll see the results from all of that and then we can get into budget and we can look at the universal credit calendar. Um, Marie was talking about scenarios, this is where we'll handle and have a quick look at some scenarios. Uh, and obviously we enter our information on the screen. The current situation, as I've already entered some information, is being shown on the right hand side of the screen here. And we can see some of that information. Um, we also have some management information, so by managing cases at the top here, uh, which we don't need to get into today, but if you are uh, looking at the software and want to have uh, further demonstrations uh, in more detail please let me know so i'm going to just quickly look at a case called phil um, phil's come in uh, we can use reference numbers anytime we're not quite sure what to fill in <laughs> no filling. and um, we can hit the question mark and the question mark will tell us what to what to complete within each um, box um, so phil's single he, he lives on the wirral which is where i am speaking to you from today uh, his date of birth is there when did he start his claim 
Um, and I'm going to look at it for both systems. So we're going to look at how doing the comparisons that Marie was talking about between uh, the current legacy systems uh, benefits and, and universal credit. Um, the makeup of the household is there's two children, uh, they're twins, one male, one female. There's no other non dependents in the house and there's no disability. If there was disability, uh, all information is, is, is uh, contextual, so we can click yes and it just opens up all the options to enter all the information you may need to uh, en enter into there. And if anybody's interested in that, I'm very happy to show disability. I'm not saying no because I'm, I'm trying to hide it. It's obviously with, with tied for time for today. We're keeping it fairly simple and straightforward. Enter information about the property. Uh, clearly, most of the time, uh, we, we can handle different things. Our local council is Wirral here. You live in a universal credit area. Uh, on the Wirral, um, the local uh, uh, housing association tell me that the rented, uh, if you're renting from a council, uh, from the housing association in a three bedroom property, the rent is £110 per week. And obviously we can change all of that. Um, does your rent include char service charges for fuel and meals, uh, rent free weeks? Uh, a number of areas do still have rent free weeks and council tax. We, we handle uh, council tax uh, for everywhere in the country. Uh, so we can change what, what people are uh, receiving uh, for different schemes that are held in the background on the system. So we don't have a worry about that. So when Marie is looking at 165 different local authority areas, um, it's all covered on the one software. Uh, income and earnings, uh, for obvious reasons, and to, to, to look at the information on working tax credits, I've, I've said that Phil is in work. Um, he's gross income. He's not self-employed. Although if he was self-employed, this, this software handles minimum income floor and all that kind of information for you. Um, he's on £8.50 an hour, 14 hours a, a week, and, um, and, and, and so on. Um, people talk about other different income income streams that people may have, or we can handle any kind of income that people may have. So to look at the sources of income, so anywhere on the, in here, so different kind of pensions that people may have, income from savings, rental income, and so on, it can all be covered within the within the software. So uh, every opportunity and every possibility is is covered. And that takes us neatly on then to say, okay, that's we've just gathered the information. It's fairly quick and easy to do that. Um, and obviously some people's uh, lives are more chaotic uh, than Phil's is, um, but we can handle all the information we want to look at. And this takes us onto the, uh, onto the results page. On the results page, if you look at the current situation, we've got the income, but we can also see that I've in, entered already information into the budgeting. And this person is already uh, showing that they're likely to be in debt, 270 pounds over uh, under overspend per, per month. So we want to have a look and we want to help people. Um, I talk about the software when I'm out talking with uh, people who are looking at the software, housing associations, local authorities, uh, citizens advice and, 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 and other agencies, and say that really what we're trying to do is do two things. We're trying to help people, uh, the advisors, your, your, your staff advise and provide the information that allows them to do that, but also to visually show people how they can get more financial resilience. And sometimes it's trying to help people understand what their circumstances are and to advise them. It'd be interesting to see, okay, you said my, what my housing benefit is, how is that calculated? Well, we can show that actually, that although the rent is 476 pounds 67, they're losing, uh, losing benefits because of bedroom uh, situation, number of bedrooms, bedroom tax, and obviously they're in earnings. We can break that down into more detail, and this more detail that like, people can take away. And if, and clearly, if they're not, if they, if they, if they're on a different amount, and we can enter that different amount, uh, and if they're not receiving as much, then it's up an opportunity that some organisations are using to go back to local authorities and to whoever to, to to put in claims to say they should be on more money. This is all printable, so you can go back and have a look at it. So we can do that for all those areas. First of all, one of the things I want to do is show how can we, how does this compare if they're going to move on to universal credit? So if we move on to universal credit, I can see you'll be better off by £71.17 under universal credit. Okay, so very easily we can see the differences between the two, uh, to the two different uh, ways of receiving benefits. But the one thing that, um, that uh, Marie was talking about very much was uh, better off in work. So if we wanted to look at change in earnings, we can very quickly see if you are on changing your earnings and saying, OK, I want to move to 26 uh, hours a, 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 a week, um, then they'd be better off by £176.16. So very quickly, I can show people and visualise to them that they would be better off. 
um, under, under both different scenarios. And if I wanted to, I can say, well, it would be very interesting to be able to highlight where you could go and get a job. And we link to Universal Jobs Match uh, to be able to do that. So uh, in, in, in this area on the Wirral, there's 260 jobs in sales, 206 jobs in sales going. And uh, you can help people uh, in that way as well. So also when we look at universal credit, one of the things it's often people find and tell me is they feel as if universal credit is, is, a, is a mysterious number. People get one uh, calculation. And if we wanted to help people in, in, in that situation, how, how is my universal credit calculated? Well, again, we can very easily show people that uh, information. And um, sorry, there's bangs going on in my house. There's snow sliding off the roof, but here we go. I'll carry on. Um, and so we can see a breakdown of how universal credit is calculated and people finding that very useful. Uh, and certainly it helps a lot of advisors understand how, how, how it's been calculated and can provide a real in-depth knowledge to, uh, to residents and, and so they can understand how they're getting to where they're getting to uh, financially. And as you see, the current situation now we're looking at universal credit is better off and they're less in debt if they had moved on to universal credit. Just clicking back to the universe to here. We we're also talking about affordability. We provide a very little bit of, if this is looking at this from a pre-tenancy perspective, we can see that the, the rent is 30% of the household income. That's my understanding, and Marie might be able to confirm this, is on the cusp of affordability. So if this is numbers going in for a pre-tenancy um, situation, then we can say probably this is affordable property for this particular household. Um, but it's on the cusp of it. 30, 35% is, I believe, about the break even uh, figure on that. Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, but what we might do with something like that is then look at, okay, we'll let the property, but work with you to um, maximise your income where we can. Brilliant. So one of the things I want to quickly nip onto is, is universal credit, of course, um, is paid monthly. Um, we're being paid uh, from our hourly work weekly. And so one of the things that happens is people's income from universal credit fluctuates. And uh, again, one of the things that Marie mentioned was the ability to have a look at the calendar so we can start helping people budget as income fluctuates throughout the year. So we have a calendar here that allows you to, to see that visually. And although the differences in this particular scenario uh, for this particular household aren't huge, the total income will vary between 1692 and 1730. Uh, in different scenarios for different kinds of income streams, uh, that can be much more, uh, much, much different. Uh, and therefore, that's a very useful way for, for helping people budget. If we are looking to put in budgetary figures, um, we can start entering the cost this person has. And one, just a couple of things I'd just point out on this. A, lo a lot of people don't know what they're spending on utilities, what they don't know how much they're spending on stuff. So we're taking uh, figures from a, a number of sources and we can put in average amounts. So I've said for this particular household, they're spending 110 pounds uh, a month on, on gas, uh, but we could put an average amount where we, where we understand what that would be. Uh, and we can start saying, if it is an average amount, it's actually only 58 pounds 84 per month. Um, and so that enables you to start creating a budget for people who are not aware of how much they're spending on, on things. Uh, I'll leave it as it was. And we can gather costs and it's broken down into a number of different sections. Uh, so when we get down to things like food and housekeeping, again, the average amount I've put in here uh, for groceries and a whole range of other, and a whole range. Of, so £305.82 a month for groceries for this household um, and things like alcohol smoking, um, £6 a day is less than a packet a day and so on. And again, one of the areas we're talking about is debt. So if people do have debts, we can put in what their debts are, what their repayments are, and make sure that goes into uh, the budget as well. Um, so ultimately we can start helping people and provide guidance um, on, a, on a whole range of, of, of different uh, bits of information. So once we've entered the costs, we can have a look at a cost summary and we can visually show people how uh, their, their spending patterns are, are and how that would compare on a, on a bit of benchmarking to households similar to them. So the house, the, the current costs are £1,902 that we put in. And after costs, we see that they are left with uh, an overspend of £270 per month. Now, I know sometimes conversations are very difficult to have for frontline advisors, and you don't want to talk about saying that you shouldn't smoke and so on. But at least one you go to here says, well, the software says um, that actually, although you're spending £42 a week 
on, on smoking, do you realize that's 2,190 pounds per year? And it does that against a range of spending that you can have. And all of this is printable, so you can start looking at that for advice uh, and start helping people. And again, we can also provide a smart budget, the smart budget, which I won't go into now for time pressures, but that allows us to put in other, uh, other bits of information around whether the household is sanctioned for benefits, whether they're receiving discretionary housing payments, uh, whether whether payments are being paid, you know, the income is being paid directly to the landlord uh, with a, uh, an APA or, or whatever you want to look at. Um, just a couple of other things I quickly want to show you then that, that, um, that, we, that uh, we were talking about is this whole idea of creating scenarios where we can look at comparisons. So here we've got the current system on the right hand side. I, I can add a scenario. Let's click on universal credit. Go to here and say on scenario one, we're going to call that universal credit. I'll just call it uh, UC for now. And on, straight away, visually, we can see the differences between the two systems if we want to do it that way. I can create another scenario. And in this other scenario, we're going to start thinking about making some changes. So although we're looking at the current system, uh, in this scenario, I'm going to start thinking about changing our income. So we're going to change our income to say uh, it's £8.50 an hour, but he's going to work for 36 uh, hours a week. And one of the things we can start changing on that because we've agreed it in an action plan and we can create the action plans we were talking about. Enter costs. He's agreed that he's going to try and give up smoking. So under, under food and housekeeping, we're going to uh, take put smoking down, down to zero. Um, and as I sometimes amusingly say, um, he's given up smoking. He's do doing a lot more work. He's going to need another bottle of beer a week. Uh, wouldn't we all? Um, so we're going to be realistic on that. But also we can start thinking about looking at debts. And he's now going to start thinking about instead of £50 uh, a week, uh, sorry, a month paying back uh, rent arrears, he's going to move that to £100 a month paying back rent arrears. And if we go to our results page now, uh, we can start seeing the uh, differences between our, our scenarios. So we can see the incomes changed, but also after costs, we can start seeing uh, whether we've got any money left over. So now we've got £123 left over, even though we're repaying our debts uh, more. And one of the things that's very nice to do on, on this one is look at comparing the scenarios. So now we can see the differences between income for our three scenarios. We can look at the differences on costs for our three scenarios. And we can look at our surplus and shortfall. So we can start visually saying that uh, under the current benefit system, we are way below the line. Universal credit, we're still below the line. But if we start thinking about changing our income and, and handling our just handling our, our budgeting better, even though we're repaying our debts at a faster rate, we're actually in credit at the end of every month. And there visually, you can very quickly show people how to do things. If you are wondering about how, what kind of advice and support to provide in this case, we can click on here and go and show advice and support. I'm looking at the time, Janet, and it's 11.27 on my computer, which says we're very close to the uh, edge of time and uh, any questions. So I'll pause it there. And, uh, okay. Let's see what we're doing. A quick counter, you've left us wanting more. Thank you very much, Peter. I hope everybody found that um, very, very useful, very interesting. Um, I am very conscious of time, but hopefully um, if I could just uh, take the time to ask three questions, if I may. And Peter, I'll stick with you before you remove off your screen. But um, one person has asked, um, is the action plan an added tool? I'm unable to see it when I go into the benefit calculator. I no, the action plan I've got open here, so I can add an action. So um, uh, come, come, come back uh, with more info on utilities or whatever, you know, on, on info on whatever, target date for that, we can put in, that should be done by then. And, uh, and so we, we just add that as an action plan. So the action plan Sorry, Peter, I wonder whether this person might have been looking at another, the, the, perhaps the free version of our calculator that's available on gov.uk. Very possibly. There, we, have a, we have a free version of the calculator, as you just uh, alluded to there, Janet, and uh, obviously it's got stripped out functionality than the, um, than the advisor's version that allows you to manage your cases and do the kinds of uh, information management and data gathering that uh, Marie was talking about earlier. Brilliant, lovely, thank you. Marie, if I could um, come back to you, I have two questions for you, if I may. Um, yeah. 
this uh, one person has asked, um, I think it was in relation to the point you were talking about there in terms of, of, of courts. Uh, this person said, we found that judges are postponing all UC cases, no matter how much debt and affordability there is within the case. Um, has the budget calculator changed your experience of this at all? Yeah, I mean, we're not using it just for UC cases, so the, the evidence gathering is for, is for all customers. We haven't experienced all UC cases being postponed. I don't know whether that person is in one particular area. Um, we've got courts across the country. We are fine. We, what we're trying to do is, is not actually go to court with, with cases where we know there's an active claim and we're supporting the customer with that, only if there's complete lack of engagement um, and then we can present that evidence very much a last resort um, and then um, Marie finally if I may and, and apologies to people who have uh, who've given questions and we haven't got time to answer we will get back to you uh, offline with with answers um, but Marie here um, how do you obtain customer engagement for the budgeting tool any any uh, thoughts on that yeah, I mean, we had to do a lot of work with, with our, our staff about how we approach that conversation because some of the points that Donna talked about, about um, shame and not wanting to disclose info, also some of the points Peter talked about, about not having that information to hand. Um, so it is very much about introducing that into the conversation in the right way. Um, customers, uh, the other thing, we, when customers are in arrears, sometimes it is, well, we, we can't enter in, into a repayment agreement without this information. We're not going to set you up for an arrangement that's going to fail because it's not affordable for you. Rather Rather than coming at the angle, well, you've got to do it or we won't agree an arrangement, it's more, it's to help you identify what's truly affordable and that, that's worked and, and also the longer we've been active with this tool, customers are more used to us talking about budget planners with them, um, so they're more likely to engage the next time round and actually proactively contact us to tell them there's been a change so we can reevaluate their budget. But yeah, um, probably one for offline if you wanted a bit more information on the material we used with staff and some of the sessions that we held. Brilliant. Excellent, Marie. Thank you very much, um, everybody. Um, I would just like to, um, uh, very conscious of time, as I say, um, Marie um, talked at great depth about um, about how Guinness is using it. We do share from time to time how other clients are using it uh, and also some of our other work as well. So if I could, if you've not already, if you don't receive our, our monthly newsletter, um, please do go onto our website and, and sign up. The next one is due out next month. Um, and it, we, you can find out a broader picture of how other other people as well as as, as Guinness are using our products. Um, I, it just leaves me now to give an absolutely massive um, thank you to my speakers today, my colleague Donna uh, and my colleague Peter. Um, but I suppose most of all to to um, uh, Marie from from the Guinness Group. It's been uh, wonderful to have you on today, Marie. Thank you ever so much for taking the time. Thank you. Pleasure. Um, and, and and everybody, if I could point to you, as Donna said, there are some uh, downloads on the panel there. Um, the uh, download that Donna referred to from Newcastle is the example of households whose situation has changed. Uh, and also you can see a flyer about the, the product that uh, we've talked through today. As I mentioned, we have a short survey at the end. And if you could take a look at that, that would be brilliant. Um, uh, I would like to give a, a shout out. And just to reiterate, one of the points that uh, Marie very kindly um, said during her session, um, just to reiterate the point that we do like to work very closely with our clients in terms of um, developing the, uh, the next steps um, for the calculator. It's not something that is static. Uh, it, it do, we do like to uh, get our clients and our head of policy, um, Zoe Charles with it, our head of policy, and, and she's built up much of the calculator. Uh, and she's extremely interested in prioritizing um, the changes that, that you think that we should need uh, rather than what we think we should we should do next. Um, but yes, I was just reiterating Marie's point there about how um, the, the calculator isn't static, it changes. Um, and for people that purchase the calculator, those those um, changes are all built in. There's no kind of nickel and dime in terms of extra costs that go on. And also, obviously, we operate for benefit changes and stuff uh, as well. Um, so, yeah, in fact, we actually have one of our user groups this afternoon. Uh, people are, are joining us in Westminster uh, to do just exactly that. So, uh, yeah, more exciting things along the way. Um, as I say, we do have a short survey. Uh, do want your feedback, quest uh, opportunity to ask more questions uh, and also the opportunity to sign up to uh, automatically get us to sign you up for the next webinar in February, uh, which is on data analytics. And I think Donna uh, and Marie both talked about that as an area of interest. Um, next week, next month's webinar is on um, who's missing out on benefits in your area. And so how can you close that gap between the uh, income and outgoings? Um, that leaves me to say um, thank you very much once again from all of our speakers. I do hope you've enjoyed today's session and I look forward to seeing you on another policy and practice webinar very soon. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Bye.